our special guest tonight. <laughs> there she is. Oh my God. Don Robinson. Hi, Don. Hey, how are you? You said the hook and I hit the thing as soon as I saw the button. I'm sorry. It was, it was perfect timing. Good. Uh, this is this song right here, Waiting on You. That was a song that you auditioned for for the group In Vogue, right? That was the actual audition. Can you? I'm listening to it now, like I'm still blown away. Sorry, I'm impressed with myself because that's pretty great. You know, I I didn't know the words, and I can I can hear even when I listen to it, I can hear myself thinking of what the next words were, and you know, trying to come up with something because we did we learned the song that day, so it's kind of hard to. It's kind of hard to close your eyes and emote and feel a song in the studio when you don't know it, you know? So, so just, this is I, the actual recording of your audition that we're hearing? the actual recording of my audition that moment. What you're hearing right now is the audition. <laughs> what, what were your emotions just, I mean, during the audition singing this? I was nervous as heck. That's what I was <laughs> Because we learned the song that day. We put down the background vocals at like 11 or about 3 p.m. and... You know, so we, we were learning the song that day. We didn't know it. And um, yeah, so I can hear myself thinking as I'm listening. I was making up words, trying to put the song together because we had just learned it that day. So you didn't know it by heart, you know? <laughs> like, this, this sounds right. I'm just going to say it. It'll exactly. fit right. It's just said, throw the lyrics away and just sing. And I was like, okay. All right, I'll figure something out. That just goes to show you how well you did audition for the audition, actual audition to make it on the album, which is now 30 years old. Congratulations on that. Uh, I mean, platinum, I mean, a successful album, most successful girl group out there in Vogue that set the table for all the other girl groups that were after you. We had Coco from SW here a few weeks ago, and she said, she's like, the reason that me and the girls got together is because of in Vogue. We wanted to be like in Vogue. She said that, she said that. She told me that in person. Every time we see each other, and we actually uh, are in touch on uh, social media. So I adore her. And I love her mom, too, Lady Tibba. Yeah. Yes. Her whole uh, family is amazing. Coco, yeah, exactly. Coco and I did a play together in, oh, I would say probably, it must have been 2003 or four, something like that. And I, I, uh, her mom made me a really beautiful card. Uh, she printed it out, made a beautiful rose on the front. And she wrote a really beautiful note to me about, she, you know, group, girl groups in the 60s and that En Vogue was indicative of that, you know, the Supremes. And I was like, what? And I told her, thank you so much because your daughter's in the well. She said, because of you guys, Coco, you know what I mean? So they all give us up their props, our props. So right. I yeah. How did you, uh, you know, go back, going back to the audition, I know you from the town, from, from Oakland, you know, exactly. Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, so how did you uh, even get the audition to audition for In Vogue? Well, that's an incredible story. I was at uh, a concert, like a summer jam. And was, it it, was it the KML summer jam at the time or like it? Yep, 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 yep. And uh, there were 22,000 or 24,000 people and most of which were women because it was, you know, uh, Expose and Stevie V. Um, who else was there? Uh, cover Girls were getting ready to come on. And in between the Cover Girls, I think um, Sweet Sensation had left the stage. And between them and the Cover Girls, my friend and I from high school, Kim, we were like, well, let's go, you know, check out guys and go get some popcorn or a drink or whatever. And when we got to the top of our section, this guy said, excuse me. And I looked, at, we both looked over at him and he said, are you a model? And I was like, whatever. And I gave, I blew him off completely, <laughs> completely blew him off. And then 20 minutes later, we came back. He was still there. And he said, excuse me. Um, and this is, you know, droves of people walking back and forth. And they were, get, they were flicking the lights off and on, saying that the next uh, act was coming on stage. And uh, it was, so everybody was rushing. And said, I'm sorry, I'm the guy who asked you if you're a model. And um, he said, are you a singer? And that's when I was like, ah, put the brakes on. <laughs> and I stopped right then. And I, I was like, yes. And we talked for about, oh, I would say a good 25, 35 minutes. I didn't even care that the other act was on stage. I didn't care about that. And my friend that was with me, Kim, actually was a model. 
and her parents had gotten her the Barbizon stuff and they had gotten her her book done and her pictures done, but he didn't ask her. Because if he would have asked her, the conversation would have been different and I would have went to my seat and he would have talked to her about, I don't know, modeling or if she could sing or not. Um, and uh, I told him that I sing, I said that he has to come to my house to hear me sing and I was like, well, first he said, I have to hear you sing. And, and then he was like, so you can come to my place. And I got, that was like, oh, I live at home with my parents. I am not coming. I don't know you. I'm not coming to my house. And he came next, about three days later, actually, he came to my house, my parents' house. I was living at home with my parents still. And he heard me sing. And he, I did, I told the baker this recently that I did um, Been So Long. Um, and he was like, yes, you are, yes, you can audition. Because he wanted to make sure that I actually had talent. Mm -hmm. Not before I got there. Like, oh. <laughs> he wanted to make sure I could actually sing, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was the that was the gist of it, and my sister took me to the audition. Now, what's great about that is that my mother asked to take me to the audition, and I told her no because I wanted my sister there. Something about sisters and brothers, you know what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. like mom is there, it's like embarrassing, you know what I mean? She's gonna say things to you that are like embarrassing, but my sister, I was like, Dana's gonna be very supportive, so. Um, the good thing was that Dana kept telling my sister kept telling me because I kept saying all day long I want to go home Dana take me home like Cindy was this child star and she had gone to Japan and worked over there and I was intimidated Maxine had uh, she was a hair braider and her and I had met at a hair salon and she was braiding hair I was getting my hair done and the owner of the hair salon was like well she's a singer and you say you're a singer so you guys do something together so that we had met before the audition well, um, but Cindy had this life. She had been a she had traveled to Japan and she was Miss Oakland and Miss California and all kinds of stuff. So I, I was just intimidated. I wanted to go home. I wasn't ready for this at all. And um, my sister was no. She kept telling me all day. She was quiet about it at first, and then she got frustrated with me. It was like she yelled at me in front of everybody. I told you. That if you come to this audition, you're going to do the audition and you're not going home. And we have been sitting here all day long. You're going to do this audition. I was like, okay. Okay. So if my mother was there, my mom would have probably said, okay, let's go. Because she didn't want me to be nervous. You know what I mean? My mom would have protected me. Where my sister was like, no, you're going to stay here and you're going to do it. I know you can. So it was beautiful that my sister did that. It was, it was the perfect situation. Thanks to your sister for being there. I mean, things could have changed <laughs> literally if she didn't push you. Like, no, you staying. You doing this? That's right. Yeah, she made sure of it, and she was pregnant too, so she was tired of me <laughs> <laughs> messing with her all day long. Like, take me home. No, I was, I was really whispering in her ear, and then she blew me up like in front of everybody. The producers, Cindy and Terry. There was another girl named Jordana that was at the audition. Uh, Maxine, of course. There. So yeah, my sister was like not having it. You're gonna stay at this audition. You're gonna sing. I know you're good. You're good. So, how did you get the news that you made the group? That you made the cut? Uh, how did I make? So, Maxine had asked me. I think she called me maybe a week after the audition and said, um, "You know, I'm doing a show in Oakland at a place called Jeffries." And Jeffries is a. Are you from the Bay Area? No, but I'm familiar with the Bay. Yes. You Okay, so Jeffries has been around since my mom was a young girl, and Jeffries has been around a while. So the older generation partied there, and then we partied there. Um, and Maxine had a show coming up, and she's like, Dawn, would you sing back? You know, do the show with me. I was like, sure. So she had clothes for me that she wanted me to see. She called me maybe the next day or the day after and said, okay, I'm going to bring the clothes over so you can choose what you want to wear. Um, and she said... I have this two different outfits. She was explaining to me what she had. And I was like, I don't care which one. It doesn't matter to me. And then she said, um, yeah, so I can't believe that we made the group. Like, we're in the group. We made it. And I was like, huh? She said, yeah, we made the group. You didn't know? I was like, what? I, me too? Like, Denny, she said, Denny said all of us made the group. Except the girl, Jordana. And it's because Jordana walked into the audition saying, um, she was asking for beer, and then she was asking for food. Y'all not going to feed us with the food? With the beer. I was like, okay, she's not going to make the 
She's asking for beer. Like, that was kind of, you know, how dare she do that? But yeah, Maxine was like, yes, you got it. You got in. You're in. We're all in. Cindy, Terry, Maxine, or Maxine and, and me. So that's how I found out. And then Debbie called me the next day and was like, yeah, you got the part. You got, you're in the group. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you're I, like, I, you're like, I already know. Maxine told me. Oh, I had to act like I, uh -oh. I said, don't tell him I told you, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's great. So then you got the group together and was, was the original name of the group in Vogue or was it something else? Oh, the, the original name was, oh boy, we had a couple of names, but the one that we kept saying over and over again was the number four and you, letter U. Mm -hmm. And it was okay. So we kept throwing around other names and Denny said there was a, a old magazine in the studio. And Denny was like, what about Vogue? And I was like, that's hot because I was into fashion before I was a singer. So um, I just thought that was perfect. And then, uh, and then we, ch I think they did a name check and the name was taken by a group in the 20s. Go figure, like a, a group, they still kept the name and uh, they still had whoever is in there or taking care of their uh, estate is still taking care of their, um, you know, their trademark for the name. So we couldn't get it. And then uh, I think, I keep thinking Raphael Sadiq, but at the time it was Ray Wiggins was his name, was at the studio with this one day and he just said En Vogue, like put an E-N on the front. And we were like, huh, okay, that's good. And they checked that name, fine. So we got the name En Vogue, yeah. So Raphael Sadiq, but back then Ray was the I one think who- so. I think so, I, huh? I, you know, it wouldn't have been, there was another guy named William that actually took Raphael's place, but William wouldn't have been in the studio with us. So, so far, you're talking about 89. Right, yeah. 90, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to think of who it was, but I think Raphael, Ray Wigan. <laughs> right, back when, back when they called him Ray. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> when he was a Wiggins. When he was yeah. a Wiggins. <laughs> so what was the first song uh, you guys recorded? Do you remember? Oh, that's a good question, my gosh. Well, Waiting on You, um, it was already done, of course, from the audition. Uh, I don't even think, I remember right, hold on. But we didn't have any kind of melody or, and well, we kind of did because we had to write to that melody. Um, so I, I think it was hold on was the first mm -hmm. one that recorded. So how did Hold On come about then? So you said someone already had the melody and you guys kind of came together and wrote to it? Denny and Tommy. Denny was mm -hmm. the one, you know, he was very in the studio, hands-on every day. Tommy was the better of the two as far as musicianship. If he could actually play piano, he was like a church pianist. Denny would pick around enough, but he got us our harmonies. So all of those harmonies that you know in Vogue for, you know, that was all Denny. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as Hold On was concerned, we wrote that at his apartment. I remember going to Richmond and we would go to his place and we would write. And me and Terry, he would put us in different rooms. Like me and Terry would be together and Cindy and Maxine. And me and Terry would laugh the whole time. So he would always say, okay, you two can't be together <laughs> because you're not getting the work done. Um, but yeah, we helped write Hold On. And I want to say that that's the person that one that we started recording. Now, we recorded Who's Loving You, which is the a cappella. Yeah. We recorded that part separately from the beat. So by the time we came back to the studio, uh, months later after we recorded the whole album, we came back to the studio to mix and master the album and sequence it, meaning we had to put it, every song in order. What's going to be number one, number two, number three, you know, through 11, 12. And when we came back to the studio, they had put those two pieces together. So the acapella with the beat, and we were like, I, I kept saying in my head, this is awful. Because we were so used to hearing the two separate parts. So I, I just thought, oh my God, this is, we're not gonna make it, we're terrible, this is awful. Why are they gonna put this? Man, I'm so glad they didn't listen to us. We had no clue, we didn't know what we were doing. And they had, they had a real good idea that this song is hot enough it's different. There's nothing on the radio like it. And um, our harmonies were undeniable. I mean, even families that sing together usually had those the harmonies that are that tight. You know what I mean? And it, we just had a beautiful blend together. It was just magical. So it all worked and they knew what they were doing. And again, I'm glad they didn't listen to me.
Because <laughs> hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed that he, they actually let you write, like, you know, on the songs. Exactly. You know, because... what was it, was it more of, hey, whoever has the best verses, or was like, hey, you're going to take the first verse, write to it, or was it a competition, or That's just finding right. out what the best one we'll use? That's kind of what it was. It was just, uh, it wasn't competition at all. It was just two teams. And whatever you got, you guys can write on this verse, like you said, first verse, I think it was Terry and I, or Maxine and Cindy, I'm not sure how it went, but he split us up that way and um, just listened to our, our ideas of hold on and what we thought was hold on and, and how we felt about having a man in our life and what that means, you know, giving him space, you know, and it's like, no, we should have had space too. When I think about it now, I would have wrote it a little bit differently because it's kind of like almost making it seem like women are needy and we're telling them don't be needy you know because men can be the same way you know men can be very controlling and that kind of thing so i, I would have written it a little bit different but it was good it was all growth is what i see it, it being now you know and do you remember the first time you heard hold on in the radio was it on cameo oh my god do i remember <laughs> it was on cameo yes my mm -hmm. mom Hold on, hold on, real quick. Who, do you remember who the DJ was on KMEO? I don't, because I oh. didn't hear anybody after that. I just, it was blank after <laughs> that. I was just screaming. Uh, my mom came running in the room. It was 6.14 or 6.15 in the morning. She was getting ready for work, and my stepdad had called her and told her he was already at Embark Embarcadero Center, and he was the, uh, he was head of security. So he called and told her, B, uh, Dawn's on the radio, and Vogue is on the radio. The girls are and my mom comes running and I was like you know I was asleep because I had to get up for school but I didn't get up until 7 um, and my mom comes running in there oh my god and she turned on my stereo all loud it was loud from the night before so it was blasting and I know my neighbors her neighbors were like oh my god but um, we turned it on and we were both jumping up and down in the room I had on my pajamas or my nightgown and it, yeah that was the moment but yeah I didn't hear any DJs because it was like I didn't care at that moment. It was uh, about be our. If it, if, it, if it was in the morning, it was probably John London the house party at that time. Man, oh my gosh! It might have been if if you're saying you're thinking about ninety, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably John London the house party well, at that time. We came out. I want to say the album dropped in April, or the single was before that, and then the album dropped in April, or maybe the single dropped in April, and then the album followed that because it's usually the same first. But yeah. <laughs> Um, that was the moment, but you're right. It was probably radio that yeah. day. Yeah. And Leslie, Leslie Silvell ended up playing it on Chaos OL. Remember her? Yes, Chaos OL was dope. Yeah, yeah Chaos yeah. OL, exactly. So, yeah, we had a lot of love. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was the moment that we that I heard the song the first time. How, how fast did things change once that, that song was on the radio for you guys? Oh, my gosh. It was, it took like a rock. I don't we tried to catch up to our success because because it happened so fast and everything was a whirlwind. One minute we're rehearsing, I mean, we're recording the album, the next minute we're rehearsing for our first tour. Uh, we had to do a promo tour for everything so that we had to let the, the public know who we were. By the time we got on that, that uh, promo tour, though, the public already knew us. So we only had the one hit. <laughs> and... I remember doing, uh, we went to, we had on what I call our, our our flight attendant outfits that we had made in the Bay Area. We had this guy make us his suit, and they were literally cream and, and navy blue. Like, we looked like we worked for United Airlines. And because we only had one hit, every time we went somewhere, the crowd was like, do it again, sing it again, do it again. So I remember being, one particular story was that we were in Florida. And we were in Miami, and we were at, what's his name? Uh, um, Daisy Dukes, what's the song? Look at that girl, the Daisy Dukes. The Daisy Dukes song. Uh, oh, God, MC, what's, uh, I know what you're talking about, though. Luke Skywalker? Yeah, uh -huh. Luke, yeah, two, two Live Crew? <laughs> yep, Two Live Crew. Mm -hmm. We were at Strawberries. That is the name of his club. And we were, and we were backstage, and we could hear this. The music was like, Suck my, you know what? Lick my, you know what? And we were like, okay, wait a minute. So you guys are gonna cut this song off right now, so that we can start and perform. And we were like, no, please don't, don't, t don't turn this song off. And they were like, well, we have to. So I said, no, let it play out. 
and then wait till the next song comes out. And that song was even worse. <laughs> so, so they were like, okay, we got we to gotta cut the song off. And you can hear everybody because there were curtains. So you can hear everybody say, oh, my God, why would they turn up? What's wrong with the music? What the F? What the this? Oh, my God. And we the curtains open, and you can hear them introduce En Vogue. And we were like, in our poses. <laughs> we were posing and doing all these poses. And, and they were like, the audience was like looking at us like, who the hell is this? And then what? Terry started singing and we did our acapella and then bump and da 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 You know, the beat came in and it was all right after that. They met us do that song three times. <laughs> back to back to back. We were like, okay, fine. Because we were like, we knew that we had upset the whole thing by taking their music off. So the least we could do is perform the song three times. And we did. And it was great. And um, after that, of course, we got more hits. But because we only had that one, we had to keep doing it over and over again. So good memories, scary memories. But that's how we had to, you know, get our, our chops, as they say, you know, cut your teeth. And right. people know who you are. And sometimes you might have to turn off the music and <laughs> upset everybody on the dance floor. You know? After a two live uh, crew Uncle Luke song, yeah, you might have to. <laughs> At least you went out at like a strip club or anything, you know, performing. Well, it probably was a strip club. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Uncle Luke, it probably was, yeah. Exactly, right? right? Probably was. So you probably didn't have to do that again because that album took off. And then your second album, uh, The Funky Divas, which was even bigger, like three times platinum, right? Uh, and then uh, can you talk about this song? Which Actually, is... Born to Sing, three times platinum. And then oh, born... Funky Divas was even bigger. So, yeah, because we sold 28 million records. So. A lot of records. Yeah. And then off that uh, Funky Divas was this one. What, what, what memories come back when you hear that song? It seemed like you was like thinking a lot of things. Exactly. It's just, it feels like a whole nother lifetime ago. It feels mm -hmm. like so young and innocent and didn't really know. I started to wake up on the second album about, okay, wait a minute. So our producers have mansions and we don't have barely enough money to pay our rent, you know, and stuff like that. So I started to get wiser on the second album. Um, but I was still on my own because the girls didn't, you know, it was like, I was starting to ask questions, but really wasn't sure. Um, you were that you were becoming the ice cube so, of the group. Yes, pretty yeah. much. Thank you. That's a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. So I started to see stuff that I wasn't happy with and started to ask questions. And like, yeah, Dawn's, Dawn's a problem now because she's asking questions. So we can't let her get close to the girls because she's going to wake them up. So, but I wasn't, I wasn't quite there. By the time Never Gonna Get It came out, that was our first single off the second album. I was still just, you know, what the industry was and how they were and how they should be working and how we paid more money and all that stuff. So what was the moment when you, as the kids say now, became woke? Like, whoa, hey. Mm -hmm. Um, when did I start? I think it's when we went to our house. He lived in the Bay Area. Uh, there's an area called uh, Black Hawk. And Black Hawk is the almost like the Bel Air or the Beverly Hills of the Bay Area about this thing. <laughs> I have a head wrap and I'm like, it's a mess. Oh, um, no, it's fashionable on you. It looks fashionable. I'm like, oh, she's styling. Okay. My first time doing a wrap. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, so we went to his mansion and we, you know, we had to know the, uh, what do you call it? The security guard at the gate had to, and I was like, oh, like that. Um, and we're driving through the neighborhood and it's like all these mansions with big, huge pillars and six and seven, eight pillars in the front. And I was like, whoa, he's living like this. So when we got into his, his actual mansion, he's like, yeah, I got a mansion. We were like, wow, Denny, good for you. And everybody's congratulating. And I'm walking around looking like, okay, you got seven bedrooms or nine bedrooms, I think it was, and 11 bathrooms or something crazy like that. And before I knew it, me and my big mouth, because I'm that one, um, I said, wow, so this is what our money bought. And he was like, and the girls looked at me like, oh, 
And I was just like, well, what the hell? I mean, you know, like, I was thinking, okay, Dawn, you're going to be kicked out. <laughs> kicked out of the group. Cause, and he was like, no, 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 no. I, it was a, I think he was telling us it was a $20 million mansion. And I was like, wow, so this is what our money bought you. And he said, no, 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 no. It was an $8 million foreclose. As if that was better. Like, come on. So you went from $20 million to $8 million, And that was better. I couldn't understand. Um, yeah, so that's when I started to say, okay, we're making all this money, but everybody else is, we're making all this money for other people. And, and I'm assuming at that time you weren't living in a mansion. That's why you're like, yo, you got no. a mansion. Oh, oh my God, no, I couldn't even afford, I can't even afford an $800,000 home, let alone $8 million mansion. No, not at all. And in fact, when I left the group in 97, we had made a million dollars put together, all four of us, put together. Yeah. So that's over a period of seven years then. That was eight years, yeah. Because eight, when you consider 89 is when we met, auditioned. Mm -hmm. Came out in 90. So yeah, by the time I left in 97, I was like, what is this? Yeah, it was not okay. Not with me. So what was it? So obviously you're asking questions and what did you figure out what was going on? What was the problem? Well... What do, you, what do you mean? Like, what was the problem with what? Like, like why, why, why were you not getting more money or the money you deserve because you were doing all the work? Because our deal, the deal that we mm. had, you know, and when you're a new group, they're not going to give you very much money up front. And we understood they're not going to give you huge points and huge percentages in your contract. So, but after you go platinum, that first album, when once Funk, I mean, uh, Born to Sing went platinum, that's when we should have tore up that old contract and went into renegotiate our a new one, new terms, you know, we need more money. And because we had the same producer, I'm sorry, the same uh, manager as our producers. Mm. Yeah, it was a conflict of interest. So he wasn't gonna, he wasn't, he said that he couldn't stand for us and renegotiate in the renegotiation. So he had to back out of the whole deal. And that meant that we had to hire somebody else in the interim to be our, to be our manager. And it was like weird, like you can't stand for us and we're going to get somebody else that doesn't really know our case and really doesn't know, understand what In Vogue is doing in the meantime. And then you want us to hire you back after we do this whole, it was too confusing. And once the girls kicked me out of the group, they went back and hired David. He, he said he couldn't represent us. Mm. So it was just stupid to me. But um, before, before you even signed the contract, though, did you know about points and publishing deals? No, we had no clue. Even when, even Denny and Tommy were very honest with us and told us that, um, you know, this is a conflict of interest. If you have David as your manager, it's a conflict of interest. And we were like, okay. I mean, we didn't know the difference. We thought, I thought, I, got, I can't speak for them, but I thought, did any time we love it, you know, they, they're family now. And so they're not gonna hurt us in any way. You know, they're gonna have our backs. And um, I was wrong about that. I should have really stood up for us much more. I sh if I was the Dawn that I am now, I would have been like, no. Nope, uh, David, you seem like a very nice man. We're just meeting you for the first time, but I don't think that that would be wise for us to do that. And I didn't ask the right questions, even with our attorney. I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't know what to ask. I had never done it before. We didn't know what to ask. So, who, so who told you what to ask? Like, when did you start finding about, okay, I need to get my publishing together? And we went on tour with MC Hammer, and MC Hammer gave us the, he was like, you guys are the biggest things on the charts right now. And you're not making money? Like, why don't you have a sound engineer on, on stage with you? Why don't you have microphones? We didn't have anything. He allowed us to use his microphones. Um, he was very, very gracious. And he showed us what camaraderie between artists is. So, I don't know. It was just, he started to see stuff. And we were seeing it through his eyes that something was very wrong. Mm. So, um, he paid for us. When we got off that tour with him, he paid for us to go to the attorney and ask questions Sit with him all day long. He paid for the whole day for us. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. So these points and this is what we're doing and this is right and what and wait. Okay, so having David as a manager and he managing our producers is a conflict. Now that's what that means, I get it. Cause he, they told us ahead of time that it was a conflict of interest, but they didn't explain what that meant. You know what I mean? Our producers told us it's a conflict of interest, but they didn't tell us what that conflict of interest meant. So uh, MC Hammer's attorney explained the whole thing, what a conflict of interest is. 
when you're a layman, you have no clue. We didn't go to school for this. We didn't go to college for the entertainment business side, side of things. So we didn't know. Contracts that I had never seen. I had seen a contract before, but it was a pity contract with this guy who was doing some local stuff with me. And I didn't like the contract. And I told him, so like, she's out of this contract. I don't know what you think you're doing with my daughter. She's only 16 years old. And it was that I was a kid. So here I am at 22. I'm like, we're asking the questions, but we really didn't have the answers that we needed until MC Hammer's attorney, because he had no interest with us. He had no vested interest in us, I should say. He had no reason to say anything else except the truth. So that's why he was letting us know, this isn't cool. You're not my client. So I can tell you the truth. This is not cool. You know, um, and you're not Denny and Tommy client either. I'm, I don't have an interest in Denny and Tommy because I'm not their attorney. And I'm not your attorney in Vogue, but I'm telling you the truth. This is not a good contract. You guys have a dinosaur deal. Again, when you're a new artist, you're not going to get an, incre an incredibly great deal up front, unless you're Beyonce. And her father made sure of it because he, he knew what to look for. He's a marketing genius, and he had the right friends in the right places. So with us, it was like, no, oh, you guys are not – you're not going to get the best deal up front. And after you prove yourself to the record company, then they'll come back in for more money. But we have renegotiated our contract. So we went in to do the Funky Divas album under the same terms that we did the first album we wanted to sing under. We never changed anything. We got the same advance, $40,000, which was $10,000 apiece. Mm -hmm. um, $10,000 for me, $10,000 Cindy, $10, Max, and Terry. Um, and... You know, that first album sold. It was like three three times platinum or eight times platinum by the time we got in to do our second. So we made it. There's no reason to not have renegotiated. Had Denny and Tom taken care of us or even Sylvia Rowan, our label, taken care of us, they'd still have in vogue today. And they would have had our solo rights as well. We had that in our contract, which is why Terry did her solo first and then I did mine. Um, yeah, so I'm going too far, but yeah. No. I mean, but you were armed with that information. So when did you go to the labels and say, hey, this is wrong. We got to renegotiate. I couldn't. Uh, oh, I you couldn't. never. Oh, because so... I didn't want to either. De Maxine called Denny, our producer. And of course, Denny says, no, everything's fine. Because for him, it was. He, only, he's, he's, he had the same amount of points. Let me see. We had the same amount of points for four girls that they had for two. Denny and mm -hmm. Only two guys splitting the same amount of points that uh, the four of us had to get all the get. So for them, it was perfect. It was working, you know, and, and didn't see anything wrong with it. So I was like, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. You can tell, but we didn't know what to do. Aren't we supposed to renegotiate our contract? And isn't this about the right time? And he was like, no, everything's fine. It's cool. So we never renegotiated. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Damn, damn record business. It happens. <laughs> I know for some, but you know, I look at stars like Garth Brooks, you know, Carrie Underwood. Um, they don't go through the same stuff. So I'm trying to look at some of the uh, comments of your fan, <laughs> fans, but yeah, they don't go through the same stuff that we do. So that that wasn't the reason then you left in Vogue. It was because of the contracts or was it something else? It was because of the contracts. It was after eight years company comes to us and says hey so um terry you did a solo album dawn you did a solo album under the same label but terry can stay in the group dawn you have a hidden agenda really terry did a solo album just like i did same exact scenario same exact label and she does she can stay in the group. you guys are kicking me out because you say i have a hidden agenda i didn't understand that and i was like well you know, and so now, you know, we have to, everybody has to be on board. And we were in Terry's room, in her hotel room. Uh, Sylvia Roan came in to, I thought it was supposed to be a uh, creative meeting. You know, what is going to be, um, we have two or three more songs to record on that album, which became the EB4 album, EB3. It was going to be EB4. And I thought um, we were supposed to have a creative meeting. What's going to be single? Um, you know, who are we going to tour with if we go out on the road? Like, you know, who are they looking at prospects for us to go on tour with? Uh, and it became a, a dawn bashing. In other words, they told me to come at a certain time. But when I got there, they had already been there for a while. So 
I got there and I was late to the meeting as usual. I was always late, but they had already been having a long drawn conversation and I came in the middle of it. So I sat near the front, near the door of Terry's room and Maxine was sitting to my right and she was on the floor and I was like, <laughs> I'm trying to get her to I'm like, Max, hey, so what's going on? What's she was like, and she was ignoring me. And I know she couldn't talk to me because Sylvia was talking and it was only, so when I got there, it was the four girls, Cindy, Terry, Maxine and myself. But why are, I know our managers are gonna be there because it was a creative meeting. So I knew that our managers were gonna be there, but why are our attorneys there? I couldn't understand that. Like, why are the attorneys here? This is not that kind of meeting. Um, and as the conversation progressed, Sylvia was like, so we can't have hidden agendas and blah, blah, blah. And I said, wait a minute. So why is it okay that Terry did a solo album and you're saying that I have a hidden agenda? Like, what is it? I don't understand. Terry did a solo album, so why why aren't you looking at her like she had a hidden agenda? And Terry turned to me and said, I said, what's different about that? And Terry turned to me and said, it just is, Dawn. It just is. You know how when we're kids and our mother said, you, you ask your mom for something, she said, and you say, why, why can't I, mom? Because I said so. And mm -hmm. that attitude was exactly that. And I was like, what did she just say? So it's okay for Terry to do a solo album. She gets to stay in the group. She's not kicked out. She's not ostracized. But I do a solo album, same exact label, and I get kicked out. So you could tell that they had conversations before I got there, like I said. And they, they didn't treat me the same. They treated Terry. It was treated totally So I then the, la the last song you recorded for, for that album was uh, this one. Let me see, Let me see if I'm right. Also on the Set It Off soundtrack. What was that? I can see the video now. Yeah, I mean, then that that was and that was it. That was the last time. Like, whoa, what happened? Why yeah. is she not? And that wasn't smart because when you think about it, that was our biggest hit, and I sang lead on it. But you know, as I'm playing some of these songs and most of the hits, you sang lead on a majority, if not good, ninety percent of the singles that came out. Am I correct me if I'm wrong? I mean, no, you're right. Um, no, uh, giving them something you feel. Uh huh. Done. Don't let go. And then never gonna get it. Maxine and I split together, and then free your mind, all four of us, and then uh, hold on with Cindy and Terry. Huh. Those are our five hits. So never gonna get it. Me and Maxine. Don't let go was me. Giving him something to feel was me. Mm -hmm. uh, free of mind it was all four of us. And then mm -hmm. hold on was Terry and Cindy. So well, still, I mean, you you got two out of the five. I mean, exactly. that's still that's still majority. And then never gonna get it was Maxine and I together. Like I yeah. said, so right. yeah, they weren't smart. I wouldn't have done it. I would not have. I mean, because to me, they weren't being fair. And I keep telling this, well, Maxine and I, the last conversations that we had with each other, which wasn't too long ago, I was, I was saying the same thing. You guys were so overtly unfair. It's one thing to say, okay, we treated Dawn the same way we treated Terry. You know, be fair. Yeah. Um, and they weren't. They weren't at all. So I couldn't understand that. Um, it didn't make sense to me. And to this day, I don't get it. I really don't get it. I oh mean, and... And you're in a rap song. Come on, you used to have a crush on Dawn from In Vogue. You were like the most popular. <laughs> oh did... my God, Fife! Oh my goodness, let me did you, did you ever meet Fife? No, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. This is hilarious. So um, we were at a concert, a Beyonce concert, backstage. After the concert was over, we were looking for the green room that we had to meet her. Everybody was going back to the green room. And at, at, down the hallway, I could, you know, you're looking around, there's a bunch of people in the hallway. It's all busy back here. And then I see Fife and I was like, but that is five, and I told my ex-husband at the time, I was like, that's five. So I'm thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be it, you know, because every single time he has big me up on so many songs, and I was like, okay, this is a five moment. And he's walking, as he's walking, he sees me, and he's like, oh! his whole <laughs> face was like that. And I said, um, five, and I said it loud. I was like, Dawn, you're embarrassing yourself. But he was getting closer, and um, he was like, Dawn. And then, he got to and then he got up to me, and he didn't say anything. And I was like, okay, fine, wait a minute. So this is the same person that kept saying to me, um, 
that you big me up on all those songs. Uh, never uh, used to have a crush on Dawn from In Folk. Uh, my man, I'll be sure he's in a fan mm -hmm. Used to have a crush on Dawn from In Like, come on, you've said this so many times. I think they said it on Can I Kick It or Check the Rhyme. Not Check the Rhyme. That was on, a, that was on a, Oh My God was the name of the song. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're in person and you have nothing to say to me? He was like, I can't talk, man. I can't. <laughs> away I, I hugged him and that was it like he walked away and then he walked away like he was leaning on the wall the whole way down <laughs> because he was probably weak in the knees oh like God. swv just weak just like i can't walk anymore he probably didn't watch that shirt for like months and years <laughs> after you hugged him but i <laughs> said to him i'm sorry he reached out to me when i did the reality show uh r&b divas and he left me a message on in on twitter and i left him a message back and then we finally got back and forth with each other and i was like Yo, I said, I have to have a hit from you. I need some hits. I'm starting to work on music. And I want to get a Fife song. I said, we need to do a song called Crush. And either use your 16 bars that you have on me. My man, I'll be sure he's in effect mode. Mm -hmm. We need to use that. Or you can do 16 bars, new, new 16 bars. And he was like, yo, let me get some tracks for you. Excuse me. This thing, I, I'm just going to take it off. But um, he never got to it. He got too sick. And his wife mm -hmm. kept telling me, Dawn, he's, you know, He's trying to work on stuff for you. And um, after a while, when he passed away, I left him a message that I'm sure is probably still sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I said, wife, um, I know you're gone, but you'll never be forgotten. You, you, what you did on this planet, um, besides your family, you have left an indelible mark on the planet. And um, we never got to work, but I'm still going to do that song, uh, Crush, and on your behalf. And I'm going to dedicate it to you. I'm doing that song. And I need your 16 bars to make that happen, you know? But now your suffering is over, you know, that whole thing. Right, yeah. Yeah. And he was living in Oakland at the time, too. Was he? Yeah, yeah. Seriously, wow. Yeah. yeah. Why not? What do you mean? Like, that was his home? Yeah, he moved to Oakland. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, my God, so him and his wife moved to Oakland. Yeah, they moved to Oakland at the time. That's amazing. That is amazing. I took it off. I can't. Yeah. I can't. Not one more second. <laughs> it's okay. But, but it's bothering me. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, oh, five. So, can you can you talk about the aftermath? Because after In Vogue, I mean, you did uh, you did stuff with the firm, obviously the firm biz, which is dope. But then uh, you you went were signed to Aftermath, and I remember that like, yo, she signed with Dr. Dre. I mean, usually when anyone gets signed to Dr. Dre, everyone's hype uh, exactly. until they never come out, which was like the same situation <laughs> with you. Wow, you know me, you know the whole situation. But mm -hmm. the real deal is that um, Dr. Dre wanted me to sign to Aftermath, but I felt like it was too new of a label. You know, so, and not only that, it was a new label had just come out. Like the Aftermath <laughs> album was months before I signed with him. So it was too new of a label and he hadn't proven himself as being solid yet. Now he was Dr. Dre, so he was dope as, as far as being a producer. But as a label, I didn't want the conflict to be that, you know, if he's going to be my producer and my label, that's a conflict of interest. So if I have a problem with him, who do I turn to? And you're already hip to conflict of interest like uh oh red flag yeah so if you have a problem as an artist you go to your label if you have a problem with the producer you go to the label if you have a problem with the label uh you go to your attorney and in this case i was like he can't be my label and my producer so you know i got out so i i went to um interscope and i i talked to my man my manager at the time was trudy green and she's like jimmy jimmy ivy um why don't you sign on to interscope and that way she can keep her relationship good with Dr. Drake, keep it creative. And, you know, there won't be a problem with a conflict of interest because she's signed to Interscope, but she's in the, she's in the, she's in the family still, but she's not directly with Dr. Dre. And I thought that was very smart because again, you need, you need to have a liaison between you and the label. I mean, you and the uh, producer. Mm -hmm. So I can't, he couldn't be the label. It's like if we would have signed Denny and Tommy, and had them as our label and our producers would have been would have been bad. But we were signed to Atlantic Records through Too Tough Enough, which were our producers. So we had Atlantic as the go-between, and that's what we needed. What I needed with Dr. Dre. Yeah. Did Did you get to do some songs with Dr. Dre during that time? I did. I did the Firm Biz Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other people's stuff. Uh, I did uh, a song called uh, "Damn You Owe Me" with a producer named uh, Gypsy. That one day I want to out because it is damn you all 
such, oh my God, when I hear it to the day, it's, my mother has a cassette tape. I gave her a bounce of cassette tape. Let's see. I gave her a cassette tape when she was still working um, at Kaiser Hospital. She had a friend there bounce the tape to a CD for her. Um, and But you can still hear how after a while, tapes start to drag. This mm -hmm. is how it was. And so the tape is dragging, but the song is still so dope. I want to put it on an album um, because, because it's a great song. But I didn't do much with Dr. Dre. We never got, you know, I think Dr. Dre had done Michel A, but there were other producers that worked on that album. So he wasn't really, he was better with hip hop. I remember one day Snoop came to the studio and he heard the track. They were smoking so much weed that I had to leave out. When I came back in, he had already put his 16, or uh, I think he, at the time, yeah, 16 bars down, spit it out, and he was gone. That's how fast they work. And I was like, I need to hear the tracks. I need to sit with them at home for a while, you know, and work, really get to know what this track is about and write from that point of view. I can't just spit it that quick, you know? Um, yeah, you're not a rapper, you're a singer. You need time, the, exactly. the emotion, you know. Background parts, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But um, and so it was amicable the way we walked away. He just wasn't ready to work with me. And at the time, he was working on um, Eminem, you know, some shady album. I was like, please, you you're working on a lot of stuff. So King T, there was another album uh, that he was working on, the rapper. Um, and he had done, but he did the same thing with Eve. Like he didn't put her out. I think she was well. Yes. So many females, and he doesn't, I don't know. I don't know. It didn't work. Um, but he was very sweet to me and very amicable. And at the time, his wife, who is now, they're divorcing. But Nicole was very sweet. And we just didn't get, I didn't get the work done with him. I did other stuff in the studio with other producers that he had, but not with him. Yeah. Yeah. Then when did uh, your good friend Raphael Sadiq, old Ray, uh, hit you up about <laughs> Lucy Pearl? Ray Wiggins. Um, but, but real quick, but you and... Because, you know, you're calling him Ray because you know Raphael from way back. You guys, you know him as a teenager, right? Oh, yeah. He played in my band when I was 16. He was 16. Um, and so his brother, Dwayne, from the Tonys, was playing, mm -hmm. uh, he was playing guitar for me. And we would do little gigs in San Francisco, barely. So, so hold up. So your band was the original Tony, Tony, Tonys, when you think about it? He was, right. <laughs> yeah. Those two, but yeah. Like Those two, of, yeah. Two to three. Um, and... Uh, so he would play, he would sit on a chair <laughs> because he was nervous. He didn't want to stand up. And I would turn my back to the audience and sing to the audience like that because I was nervous. So we were both nervous and, and, you know, we were kids. And I think we would make like $80 and have to split it four or six ways. We had a guitar player, a bass player, a keyboard player, a drummer, um, and two background singers and me, and you know, it was just a lot of people split that little $80. <laughs> so when I think of it now, it's hilarious. But um, Raphael and I have known each other years, so that's why I felt like when he got me the contract, I did not do what I did in the first contract with Invogue. I did not redline it. I read it, but not really. I didn't go through it. I just thought, he's not going to hurt me. How naive. You think in hindsight, you look back at stuff and you're like, why didn't I take time? You know what I mean? And I remember him telling me he didn't have a huge advance to give me. He gave me a lot of money up front. But um, you know, anything that I need, he has people that he can go to and get it. So I was like, okay. So by the time we were, we were still working on the album, but we had some problems, some hiccups. Okay. We were supposed to release the album in June. Here we are. In and I had a house at the time. So the bank is calling me like, hello, we're going to take it. And I kept telling Raphael, he's like, Don, I don't know. He would call me Don all the time. I'm like, my name is Don. Can you get it? <laughs> You've known me all your life. Come on, 16 years old. You still call me Don. Um, I was like, what's the, what do you call the sunrise? And he's like, the Dawn. I'm like, yeah, that's my name. So um, he, he just never came around. And he's like, well, call Overbrook, which is, you know, the label that we were doing the Love and Basketball soundtrack on, which is uh, Will Smith's label. And tell uh, Pilar, I think her name is, tell Pilar that, you know, you're going to do this song on your own. And I was like, what? Like, she's going to, that's not good business at all. Like, I, I, I can't do that. And he's like, Dawn, I don't know what to tell you. And I was like, wow. So I called Pilar and I said, Pilar, 
<laughs> I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm going to do the soundtrack for Love and Basketball by myself. I'm going to do a single. And she's like, huh? I was like, um, Pilar, forget that I even called you. Like, forget this phone call. Because I knew it was bad business. You come there as a group, and then all of a sudden, one of the members of the group is calling you to do the song on her own. Like, that did not look good on my part. And she didn't understand it. And uh, I, I dismissed myself from the call and apologized to her. And then we did Love and Basketball, and I ended up losing my house. I lost it. So, the, you know, him and I, is, there's a love-hate relationship there because there's no voice like Raphael. I hear him. I literally get choked up when I hear Raphael. There's something in his voice that I just relate to and remember as a kid, and I just love Raphael's sound. He's not a crooner, so he's not a Maxwell. He's not a Luke Devandros, but he has something about his voice that nobody else has. And I love Raphael, love him, love, love, love him. But um, Ali too, you know, Ali after um, I was, after I left the group, because we weren't supposed, it was a one-off. Lucy right. was a one-off, so we but was the But was the losing the house the instigator for you to leave the group? It was, but I was telling Raphael, if we could do this again, you know, maybe I can get the house back or maybe I can get another house. Like we, you know, I'm here, I'm in the trenches with you, I haven't, I haven't been a prima donna. I don't ask for much. I'm here on the road with you, even though I'm not getting paid very much. I'm overseas with you in the process. My, my house is being taken from me right now, and I'm still here in London with you right now. I don't know how much more I have to prove to you, but I'm here. So, you know, if you could hurry up and get me some money, maybe I can go to the bank and say, look, I have a lump sum. It's like 10 grand that I'll put, you know, to keep my home. And he's like, um, we'll figure it out, but we never did. So there's a lot of water under the bridge. It's hard to forgive someone after something big like that happens, you know? We as black people, it's hard to buy a home, let alone keep a home. And I wanted to keep my home like anybody would, you know? So, you know, you said you have my back if I need it. And then when I tell you I need it, you're like, oh, well, every man for himself is what he told me. I'm like, huh? first of all, last I looked, I was a girl. I'm not a man. <laughs> I don't understand what you mean by that. And he's like, well... You should call Overbrook. Oh my God! Like this is bad. So um, the bank didn't understand, and I ended up losing it. Yeah. So maybe he, he was upset that he he thought he needed a bigger share of that eighty dollars when you were kids doing the band. Maybe so. <laughs> and I would have given it to him. That's the case. I really had to lose my house. Like, come on, that's that's. Yes. And so it's hard to. It's very difficult. To give after something like that happened but I've been willing to do that and work with Raphael because you know he kind of explained it like you know the label um I think our label was uh his label was Pookie Records mm -hmm. that's what I was signed to but we were signed to Pookie Records through another label which was uh Alan Kovac was his name is his name and I know he had left bank management because they managed it both for a minute but when they when we I kicked out of the group. That's who was managing us. Go figure. Same people that did that to me is doing this with Lucy Pearl. So it kind of felt um, almost on purpose. Um, but I'm like, wow, it only happens to black groups. It only happens to black acts. I'm not understanding that. You know, Bobby Womack went through the same thing. Such a great artist. Um, and died almost with nothing. As great as he was, you know, writing for people like the Rolling Stones as a black man, writing for the Rolling Stones, that's pretty amazing. Um, so I don't understand what was going on with Raphael, but we've tried to have the conversation. He called me and left me saying, you know, I'm sorry for everything that happened. I was really young back then, but just recently he kind of cursed me out about it. Like, you know, I, okay. So I was watching something on MTV, I want to say called Beats, Rhymes and Rhythms. Mm -hmm. It was about, it was about a tribe called Quest. Right. And... I was like, oh my God, that song, um, you know, Crush. Mm -hmm. So I contacted Ali and I, I called him and I just said, Ali, I have a great idea. Because at that time, um, um, Five had just passed away. So uh, I said, do you have any way of getting contact with the people that have his estate? Like, I want to do a song called Crush and I need his 16 bars. And he said, oh my God, his wife is putting together an album right now of some of the stuff that he never released perfect time for that song it would be great so i was like okay so um he said and before we hang up Raphael wants you to call him because he wants to work with you on 
He wanted me to go and do a show in New York with him or something. I said, but I'm not going to do that show. If you're not there, Ali. We got to do the show together. If it's going to be Lucy Pearl, it's got to be you there too. And he said, okay, if you want me there, I'll do it. So um, I, before we hung up, I said, so give me, can I give Raphael your number? And I said, yeah. I, every time you ask me to give Raphael my number, I always tell you yes. And you say, okay, I'll give it to him. And then I don't hear back from Raphael. So I said, please give him my number. So I, I think about 20 minutes later, I was like, wait a minute. No, no. Because there's so much stuff that happened. I lost my house. We have to have a conversation first before we can go. And you can't sweep it under the rug like it never happened. That is a house. It's not like I lost my purse or my wallet or my phone. I left it in his car or a book that I was reading. This is a house. This means my equity, all of that stuff. My, my credit was affected. I mean, I lost the house. Raphael has to talk to me about this first. So um, Raphael called me maybe about a month later. I was walking my dog and... I got a phone call from him. I was like, oh, Raphael called me. And I listened to his message. He's like, yeah, so Ali just told me that you're upset because you lost your house. Nobody gives a fuck about that. Nobody cares. And I was like, I just deleted it. I didn't want to hear any more because it was too painful. Hmm. Um, I guess he was try trying to say it's water under the bridge, let it go. But you can't let something like that go. You have to. You gave me your way to have my back when I needed you. And then I needed you, you didn't have your back. And I lost my house. So there's something that we have to discuss right now. And um, yeah, he never did. So he called me about maybe three or four months after that. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I was young back when we were doing Lucy Pro back in 2000, uh, 99, 2000. I was really young back then. And I was like, no, you just said to me not too long ago that who gives a fuck about you losing your house? You just said that. So you did, that wasn't when we were younger. You know, this is just recently that you kind of reiterated how you felt about me back then. And you didn't care that I lost my house. You made it very clear. So I didn't forget that. You know, it's kind of, yeah. Then that's the last conversation. Yeah, it wasn't a conversation. He left me a message. Oh, messages, okay. Yeah. yeah. But it should be, that's the thing. It should be a conversation, not via message. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Well. But besides the point, it sounded like you guys had fun on that project before that. Amazing time. <laughs> you, oh my God. Because I explained it to people like this. And Vogue was put together by two producers. Thank God they had an audition because that changed all of our lives, including theirs. But, and Vogue was, you know, it was overseen by two people. Really, Denny was the crux of the whole thing. So he was too dictatorial. He was a dictator. You would tell us, like, you know, we're in the studio and we're laughing a little too, bit too hard or too loud. He'd get frustrated and tell us to shut the fuck up. And we'd all look at each other like, and we would laugh at it. Or he'd tell us to go the fuck home. You guys get all your stuff, go the fuck home. Everybody go home. And we're giggling and, and gathering up our stuff. And then we go out to the parking lot and try to figure out who made him mad today. Who pissed him off today? And we'd giggle. But I was like, this isn't funny because he's, he's verbally abusive with us. That's not okay. And after a while, I was like, okay, you guys, I don't like the way he talks to us. And Maxine was like, well, Dawn, you know, you should talk to Denny if you have a problem with it. And I was like, huh. okay, so I can get kicked out of the group by myself. It's going to take a group effort. Why me go to him by myself? I didn't realize that I had power. I didn't realize, Dawn, you have a contract. He can't just kick you out of the group. But at that time, nobody really knew who Envog was yet. We were just getting known. So they didn't know who the heck I was. And if he would have kicked me, it would have been like Desi's child with the other two girls. Like, even when they kicked them out, they were known already. With us, we hadn't even come up with our first album yet. So how am I going to go to Denny and say, I don't like the way you're talking to us. He would have kicked me out. But it was fun, though. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Yes. So what? So what is the the future for Don? Uh, you know, obviously Lucy Pro, possibly if you can, you know, have a conversation with uh, Ray uh, or, or my house back. Yeah, we'll talk. Have you ever had a house? Or yes, yes, I, yes, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Can you imagine losing? I, I can imagine. Yeah, if you lost it, because yeah. good conversation and work together again. I don't think so. It's kind of mm. different. Um, so, you know. Um, I'm doing my own thing. That's the only way that I can work it out. I've been mm -hmm. into 
I know what it feels like. I did the R&B Diva show with another group of girls, you know, and, and that was a lot of fun until they got messy and then I had to leave the show. Um, but I, I really enjoy working with people. But now I think it's about me proving to the world who I am as an artist. Um, so I'm working on my autobiographical book and it's just talking about you know, my life within Vogue mm -hmm. and the world and the 30 years that I've been business and how things have changed, how the industry has changed. Um, you know, the story of how I came to be who I am. The stuff that I've already told you, but just expounded on. Mm -hmm. And and I'm also working on music too. I have a new crew of people, finally, the right people. Um, investors. Mm -hmm. So finally, and I've been working on investors for years. I've had a business proposal that I put together years ago. And you know, you give it to this investor, oh, you, you need a million dollars, you need 500,000 or 250,000 or 100,000. Give me a proposal. I have to adjust the budget each time. And then I give it to them and it's like, oh, well, you know, the industry is really something that we don't understand. And, it's, you know, we're not into entertainment world. It's too risky. And I'm like, first of all, I'm an artist who has been proven in the world, in the market. So I have a fan base overseas and uh, here in the States, abroad and, and here in the States. And do an album with me means your money will come back much quicker because you have I have but it's hard to explain to people that are not in the industry so now I have an investor that understands what it is that I have to do and he gets it you know and he gets it so I got a good team I have a really good team good publishing company for my book um, my publisher is actually one of my good friends and he's like a consultant so he knows the industry he knows contracts and I look to him for a lot of spiritual connection as well him and his wife his wife is very understanding and she's like don't know talk to my husband talk to him see what he has to say. she's really understanding what to do because i'm like i'm sorry you guys i know it's two in the morning but i have to call right now because this is happening and he gets it you know they're not upset about that ever. what about uh, getting back with in vogue any chance of that i won't say never 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 but a lot of stuff has to happen i think i have have work to do first before I consider going back because if I'm going to be treated like work for hire and not treated like I am do the respect that, I, that I'm old and Maxine I think feels the same way if I go back I'm not any but I'm not a child you know this is not 19 they don't own anybody. that's what they they treat us like they own the group and so we're gonna you guys do what we're gonna keep Rona and we're gonna, and I'm like, Rona doesn't need to be a part of this right now. Rona needs to let us have our 30 year anniversary with our fans on our own, because she wasn't there for the beginning. So why should she be there for the 30 year? She didn't help build that. Well, she's been with us longer, okay. And when that 13 years that she's been with you guys comes up, then you guys go ahead and celebrate that. But let me, Terry, Maxine, and Cindy celebrate that with our fans. Let it be pure, just us, and let her back off. Like in two. And for our 20 year anniversary, um, Rona took a back seat. She sat it out. She let us do our thing and we toured here in the States and then we toured abroad. We went to Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Paris, London, um, Ireland, Cork Island for the first time um, and uh, Cork Island and Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, and then we came back, we toured some more in the States, and then we went over to China. I mean, we did our own thing, but Rona wasn't around. When, 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 uh, when uh, what's her name? Uh, oh my God, I can't think of her name. Don't, you just said her name earlier today. Alicia Keys asked us, graciously asked us, to share the stage with her, and it was SWV and us. And at, at the B, it was at the BET Awards, right? BET Awards, yeah. Exactly. Um, she didn't want Rona. She wanted the four originals. And Rona got very upset about that. And she had to be put in her place pretty much by Terry, who just let her know, someone's requesting something of us. And she wants the original four members. You can't be mad at somebody because they want what they're used to seeing. And that's how I feel right now. So I don't understand how they don't get when I'm saying it the same way Alicia said it. Alicia was very clear. She wanted the four originals. And I'm very clear that I want the four originals. So that's a good analogy, a good way to put it, because Alicia, what Alicia wanted is what Alicia got. <laughs> we didn't argue with her. We were like, okay, and we did our thing. And, and it was great. It was brilliant. Um, 
again, she was gracious because she could have used all that time instead of having SWV and Vogue and TLC, she could have used that time herself. That was her time. So she was kind enough to share that stage with us. And, um, but she wanted on it, and that's my point. So I'm not backing down. I know what I want for our fans to see, and it's fair. For... Rona has been a part of the group, and she's not missed a beat as far as making money with them. Whereas Maxine have a hard time getting any shows. She's making sure she's doing shows every weekend, sometimes two and three, sh two shows a weekend, roughly for the past 14 years. Come on. And Maxine, for me, um, it was hard to get, it was really difficult. I called the agencies and I'm like, okay, Universal, can you guys book me? And they're like, well, you don't have the Invogue name. You don't have the Invogue brand. And I'm like, okay, but I'm one of Invogue. Like, come on. And they, if I had a hit, it would be different. But because I didn't have a hit by myself, I hadn't proven myself. So it's difficult for the market to get work. And, and we, have, we, we have to explain, Rona is the replacement, the third replacement member of Invogue, not the coronavirus, as everyone here is like, oh, yeah, get rid of Rona. Nobody wants Rona. So it, it works both ways, really, when you think of it. <laughs> Everyone's here thinking, you're thinking of the COVID-19. Yeah, no one wants it. Yeah, yeah. Nobody wants Rona. Exactly. Nobody wants Rona, no. Janet is her name. Um, she's always been gracious to us in the press, but I just thought, yeah. come on, you know, just let us have this by ourselves. And, and as, as we should, that's all we, we want to see the originals. I mean, anything other, whenever groups try to, when they break off and it's not all the members, it's like, it's borderline like a cover band now. We don't want to see yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I told Cindy and I, we had a meeting before we actually did the charity event seven months, eight months ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, Cindy and I were sitting at the table. We were meeting with them and at the table, it became Cindy and I back and forth with each other. And she was saying, well, Rona's been with us for 14 or 13 years. And you know, we had a uh, our album with number uh, 10 on the charts. And I was like, okay, that's nice. I said, so when the 13 year anniversary for Rona comes up, you guys can celebrate that with Rona. Mm -hmm. Like, let us have this time. I don't understand why we can't just have this time by ourselves with the four original members for a few months, even if it was just six months, we could have started in January. We would have been messed up because now Rona kicked everybody's butt, um, the coronavirus. But yeah, the, other, the other Rona. <laughs> the other Rona kicked our asses. But, um, you know, we could have continued on like in t 2021 once everything mm. comes back to hopefully not the way it was, but gets better than where it is. Um, we could have continued that, that tour. Um, I don't understand why they kept it. I was really upset because they kept fighting for Rona Bennett to be mm -hmm. in the group, and they didn't fight for me at all. Everybody was so ready to kick me out for doing the same thing Terry did. So I had a little bit of a greed, uh, what do you call it, a bone to pick with them about that. Um, but here you guys are fighting so hard to keep Rona in the group. I don't understand this. Um, and I said, and so, and you know, when Maxine and I do an album within Vogue, we don't do number 10. We go to number one, baby. <laughs> we do. <laughs> We do number ones. We don't do number 10s and 11s and 12s. We do number ones. So I'm sorry. I had to be real about it. That's just, I can't be anything other than who I am. And I can't help but see the truth. And I speak it. And sometimes it gets me in trouble. Sometimes I'm like, I don't care. Because it's, it's what I feel. You know, we all live on this planet. And we all have to speak our own truth. So otherwise, you're not doing yourself a good justice uh, by, you know, speaking. You, you speak what other people want to hear you say. That doesn't make me feel good at all. I speak like other people want me to talk. Instead, I speak how I speak, and I speak my truth. And that's why we love you, Don. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for 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 joining us. I know we went over an hour, but I mean, I could just I could just sit here. Really, I'm like Fife Dog, just like watching <laughs> you. Honestly, I'm like Fife. I don't. Now I might. Put my head now. I'm okay. It, it, it doesn't matter. And uh, who who else was like, oh, I mean, Alex Mejia, if you go more, but yeah, like uh, Kevin Nash. But Kevin Nash was KSOL, if I remember. Yeah. Exactly. Well, what about John London? Wasn't he there? Yes, John London was at the beat. Uh, he's not doing radio anymore. He's, he, he found God. And okay. uh, so he's, uh, I think, I believe in Texas. But uh, Dennis is back up in there. Uh, I think Diana Steele's back in the Bay Area, too. Oh, Diana uh, Steele, yes. Yeah. We were on our way to leaving two radio stations that we had to do during the um, uh, award show. And all of the award shows were happening at the same time and we were going from one radio station and we were in a limo with our manager and we, we could hear him on the radio, John. And when we got to Cameo, he locked us out. 
would not let in the door. Oh my God. So I remember that to this day. And uh, Shirley Strawberry was with me. Yes, Shirley, yeah. Well, Shirley Clark back then, but yeah, Shirley Strawberry yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah. And Harry walked up to her at this thing, at this um, like a, kind of a meet and greet thing. And she said, "What? how much ass do we have to kiss in this industry? You guys locked us out of the building and we were outside in our cars and we could hear you talking saying En Vogue is a no-show on the radio. So they made our fans think that we didn't show up and we were outside. We just couldn't get in.